bias is also complex in that it has so many different kinds of explanations associated with it. Don't feel like you need to process this whole figure all at once. I just want to give you a sense of the range of different explanations that have been made about different kinds of societal prejudice. And if I had to arrange them, I would array them from the more personal, private, psychological explanations to the more sociological explanations. You're actually going to see the same spread in your textbook, where similarly, you might be a little overwhelmed at the sheer number of ways that your textbook tries to explain racism and sexism and so on. So we are going to start talking about social cognitive explanations, kind of in the middle of the spectrum there. And really the question here is whether there are basic aspects of how we process information that make it easier to develop stereotypes and prejudice. And this idea was really developed by this guy named Gordon Allport. He wrote one of the most influential books in social psychology about prejudice called The Nature of Prejudice. And he basically argues that stereotyping at least partially emerges because of these more basic principles of how we interpret information. He talks about how we're naturally set up to try to perceive patterns, try to perceive events as causing each other, and that we're also operating on this sort of cognitive miser principle. We don't want to waste extra time and extra effort coming up with complex explanations for things when we can use simple explanations for things. This is going to remind you, or should remind you, of um, when we talked about heuristics, availability or representativeness, for instance, and all the ways that we kind of leap to assumptions based off of fairly small amounts of information. So again, think about the fact that our brains have a hard time not perceiving patterns in the world. Like if you see these illusions, what do you see? You probably see a triangle and a sphere. But if you stop and kind of force yourself to think for a second, you would realize that really there are three circles with little divots cut out of them, or these various cones. And it's the negative space between these other objects that we almost unavoidably perceive as itself being a solid object. Or what about this? What do you see? Probably a leopard, right? And I'm not just imagining this because I just finished Tiger King. Um, rather, we have these gestalt principles of perception where we, you know, draw the lines between the dots. Um, we fill in the gaps and we often see patterns where really there's not enough evidence to fully make that inference. And so let's think about what the least effort principle and this habit our brain has of making patterns, how this applies to social situations. So let's imagine that um, I was born in the Midwest and never really left. And so I've lived this pretty sheltered existence where I've only ever met two people from California in my entire life. And the first person I meet from California totally stereotypical, total beach bum, loves to surf. The second person I ever meet from California, also stereotypical, loves getting out in the sand and the sun, loves to surf. And so the least effort principle would push me away from withholding judgment or searching out additional information about what your typical Californian is really like. Instead, I would be very quick to weave together a pattern develop a really strong stereotype, and make the assumption that almost all Californians are total beach lovers. And so when I meet the third person I have ever met in my life from California, without even thinking about it, I might start to ask her, you know, how many times a week she gets out to catch some waves. This might be an explanation of why it's so quick and so easy for us to form stereotypes, but it doesn't necessarily explain the content of these stereotypes in the first place. And for that, we have a couple of different possibilities. One possibility about where, where we get the content of our stereotypes is that they're based on some small kernels of truth. And there's a little bit of evidence for that. I'm going to talk about this with regard to gender. So I'm going to provide you with a couple of different domains, and I'm going to ask you to guess the direction of the gender difference in each domain. <laughs> 
Do you think that men or women are typically more involved in their conversations? Like they show more attention, they pay more attention. Do you think that men or women are more aggressive on average? Do you think that men or women tend to be more restless, like physically kind of agitated, physically fidgeting, things like that? Do you think that men or women tend to be more influenced by group conformity pressure? And do you think that men or women are better at decoding nonverbal cues from other people? Okay, you might actually try to really lock onto these in your memory or scribble down what you said for each. You're going to see the answers in just a second. All right, this is the actual truth based off of psychological studies. It turns out that women tend to be more deeply involved in the conversations they have, more susceptible to group pressure, and in fact better at decoding nonverbal cues. Men, on average, are somewhat more physically aggressive and somewhat more physically restless. Were you surprised or did you get all of these correct? I'm guessing that for the most part, you were probably pretty accurate. And this is borne out by some research that um, was done by SWIM in 1994. Now we're looking at the data she actually collected about what college students estimated, that's the perceived difference, and actual differences that had been observed in real psychological studies um, and plotting them against each other for a bunch of different domains. So each of these little boxes with a dot in the middle would be in a separate domain. That would be like verbal intelligence or decoding nonverbal cues or kind of offering heroic aid in um, emergency situations. And for each of those little dots, you're plotting the actual gender difference that was found in real psychological studies versus the difference that these college students estimated in Janet Swim's study. And that red line would represent a perfect one-to-one -one match between the actual degree of gender difference that exists in the world and the differences that the students estimated or guessed. Now, you're seeing that there's a fair amount of accuracy, not perfect accuracy. Sometimes people overestimated gender differences. Sometimes they even underestimated them. But one of the really interesting things is that almost never did people get the direction of the difference incorrect. So now what I'm showing you here is the four potential quadrants that these responses could have fallen into. So the red quadrant here is situations where the actual gender difference, higher numbers here mean men show more of that trait. The actual gender difference is slanted towards men and the students believed that the gender difference was slanted towards men. The blue quadrant here would represent instances in which the actual gender difference slants towards women and people perceived that the actual gender difference slants towards women. And then the two purple quadrants would represent instances in which people got the direction wrong. They thought that women did more of a thing or men did more of a thing, and it was actually the opposite. So you can see that there's really not that much of that last possibility. People are generally aware of the correct direction of difference between men and women. However, as your textbook points out, stereotyping often means that we overestimate the homogeneity within a group and we underestimate the similarities between different groups. So the reality might be, that, yeah, you do have a difference in a particular direction, but there are still, for instance, lots of women who are more aggressive than lots of men. And when this becomes a stereotype in our head, we can often assume that all women are at least a little bit less aggressive than all men, and that's just factually incorrect. All right, so another really intriguing possibility is that we infer gender differences and other kind of social differences from real life differences in social roles. So for most of us, as you're walking around the world, you're likely to see disproportionate numbers of men and women in different kinds of roles. You might see a lot of examples of women who are spending time with children, um, either their own children or in kind of caretaking roles, preschool teachers, daycare teachers, right? Um, and you might see a lot of men who are involved in these more sort of assertive or aggressive occupations, maybe a Wall Street trader or a construction worker. And 
we have socially savvy brains, right? And we're eager to see patterns in the world. And so one thing we might do is not only chalk up this disproportionate representation to the kinds of social expectations or social limitations that people of each gender face, um, we might also infer that men and women have qualities that make them especially well suited for these social roles. We might infer that women are warmer or more caring or more tender. We might infer that men are more business savvy, more logical, or more aggressive and assertive. Now, this isn't just a kind of theoretical possibility. There are actually some really interesting experimental studies that show that we're very quick to do exactly this. Now, I'm not going to go into the full details. This is actually kind of a complicated experiment, but I'm just going to really quickly run you through what these researchers did, Hoffman and Hearst in 1990. And they tried to set up a situation where the research participants wouldn't have any pre-existing biases. They introduced them to these completely fictional alien species who they called the Erinthians and Acmeans. So imagine there's, you know, the 12th moon of Jupiter or what have you, and it's discovered that there are these crazy aliens living on this planet or on this moon. And what they tell you about the Erinthians and Acmeans is you're going to meet a bunch of representatives of these species, and you're going to learn a little bit about their personalities, and you're going to learn a little bit about what kind of role they have in this society. And it just so happens that although they show you that the Acmeans and Erinthians have a diverse array of different personality characteristics that aren't really correlated with which species they come from, they do show you that overwhelmingly Orinthians are involved in things like childcare on this alien planet, and the Acmeans are overwhelmingly involved in occupations that they called city worker occupations, so things involving business and finance and so on and so forth. Even when their personality characteristics were not assertive or aggressive, but rather things like funny or gentle. And then they ask participants at the end of, you know, meeting or being introduced to all these little characters, they ask them to try to describe what they thought the underlying qualities of each quote unquote species were. And you can probably guess exactly what happened. Regardless of the personality traits that were ascribed to the Orinthians and the Acmeans, when Acmeans were overwhelmingly shown as city workers, people thought that they were assertive and aggressive. And when the Orinthians were overwhelmingly shown as being child care workers, the participants thought that the Orinthians were probably very empathetic and caring and gentle and passive. And so it shouldn't be hard to see how this might apply back to our everyday society, right? If we are mostly seeing men um, in occupations like Wall Street trader or construction worker, we're going to infer that men as a gender, as a sex, have certain traits. It's what our brains do. And when we see women overwhelmingly in roles like nurse or kindergarten teacher, it's also easiest for us to assume, again, certain underlying traits, which might be one reason why counter-stereotypical representation is so powerful and so important.